What's going on? My name is Ed. But for sure you know that already, right? I mean, it's part three of this series. Come on now. But if you haven't already, be sure to check out parts one and two. And without further ado, let's begin the end. When I designed and 3D printed the center panel of the desktop, I actually added a notch where I could add a steel insert for use with the magnets to keep the desk closed. I wasn't happy with the strength of the magnets though, so I wanted to add another to the side. Problem was, the matching catch plate was now kind of inaccessible, and of course this was my last one, so sacrifices had to be made. At least my wife will always have a ruler nearby for all that Excel work. I did cut the ruler in half down the middle, but it would be irresponsible to show you how I did, so let's just say I used tin snips. Yeah, tin snips. Much better. To get power into the unit, I used my hole saw to cut a hole and then ran a power cable to the outlet. I just used hot glue to give the cable run a clean look. I then covered the hole with a 3D printed cover to finish it off. I would need to run power up to the desktop as well, so I started off by cutting a hole in the Besta to run the cable through. Luckily I stopped before going all the way through because I was far enough in the front to actually have a huge chunk of the cut visible. So to solve the issue, I cut a hole on the inside to where I wanted the cable to run through. Then it was just a matter of using anything I could to cut a channel diagonally from the first hole to the second that was large enough to pass my cable through. I kind of brutalized the finish of the Besta, but no problem. 3D printer to the rescue once more. With the construction mostly complete, it was time to install the electronics. Other than the actual actuator, there are four other main pieces I was working with. The first is this microcontroller board, which works as the brains of the operation. For this project, I use an ESP32. If you're not familiar with that or anything I just said, I know how you feel because this project popped my microcontroller cherry. I'm not gonna lie, it was super intimidating to work with this stuff for the very first time, but man do I have the bug now. My inner nerd has been awakened to match my outer nerd. And the possibilities truly feel endless. Yeah, I spent way too much time on that. Next, we have a 12 volt power supply to power everything and a buck converter to bring that 12 volts down to 5 volts so that I could work with my ESP32 as well as my LED lights. Lastly is this motor controller or relay that's used to receive the go up or down signals from this little guy and send those orders to the actuator along with the juice to make it happen. I didn't have a specific plan but I started mounting close to the hole where my cable runs would be so that my cables wouldn't have to be overly long. Not at all sponsored, but I have to say this universal wire stripper is game changing. There's nothing wrong with using a traditional wire stripper, but this guy, boom, magic. It adjusts automatically to the thickness of your wire. It doesn't cost too much. I paid around 25 bucks. I'll leave a link in the description down below, but to sum up, not bad. Oh, so much better. I like and subscribe would be absolutely electrifying. Also, it would be great if you made a purchase from Ed's affiliate links below to help support his stripping. What? Are you shocked? I mounted the power supply, buck converter, and motor relay, and now I would have a better idea of how long my wire runs need to be for the final design. To save myself some trouble, I used these lever wire connectors when I had multiple wires to connect. I'm using no-name connectors here, but the name brand for these that people usually look for is Wago Connectors. Looking at the aftermath, there were way more wires than I expected, so I'm definitely thankful I had these on hand. One of the really neat gadgets I found to use in this project was this tiny thing. It's called a time of flight distance sensor, and that's because it pulses out beams of light to the nearest object, which are then bounced back to the sensor, which then measures out how long the round trip took, i.e. the time of flight. From this, it can calculate how far away the object is. This is a freaking LiDAR sensor that's smaller than my thumb and that only costs around $5. If you can't afford food, don't worry, you can still have LiDAR. The ESP32 microcontroller board that I'm using has built-in touch sensors that I'll be using for actuator controls. I ran the wires for these touch inputs up to the desktop along with the wiring for a small OLED display. I didn't want to attach the desktop cover panels on this side permanently in case I needed to access the electronics underneath, so instead I added a channel to the 3D prints to give it additional tension to hopefully hold them in place. 
To make my touch buttons, I cut out rectangular pieces of copper that were thicker than necessary, but that's what I had on hand. I used the Dremel to make the cuts as well as to file down some of the edges, but didn't go too far with that since they would be cover up by this 3D printed cover. To make the labels for the buttons, I used the cry cut. I swear for the longest time I thought it was pronounced cry cut until I watched videos on how to use this thing where they keep saying cricket. Then I noticed the logo and it made more sense, but I still prefer cry cut and that's what I'm going to call it, damn it. It's a pretty delicate process all in all and pretty stressful since I don't do this very often, especially with such small pieces, but I managed to get through it with a bit of trepidation. When I designed this 3D printed panel for the buttons, I added holes at the back for the wires. One by one, I soldered each corresponding wire to each button. I actually worked on top of the desktop, so it was also a decent way to see how that held up. I added some hot glue to secure the controls down, and now I was ready to mount everything to the desktop. I used more hot glue to secure the OLED screen and control panel to the 3D printed desktop cover panel, then I popped everything into the desk. With the help of a toothpick, I used even more hot glue to attach the front plate for the cover panel. To tidy up the wires, I just wrapped them around with electrical tape. I also cut out a notch on the far end of the cover panel so that the door could accommodate the wire bundle when opening and closing. A nice thing about the ESP32 boards is that you can actually set them up to hook up to your Wi-Fi so that you can update them wirelessly if need be. But how could I resist another round of gratuitous desktop testing? Now that we're entering the home stretch, I know what you're thinking. Still not enough LED lights, right? In my last video, I added LED strips to the back of the Besta, then brought wires through specifically to add more lights. My idea was to add a light bar between the Besta and the bottom frame with the help of these aluminum LED channels. The channels I'm using are a deeper type, which will be better for light diffusion. I marked and measured where I needed to make my cuts, but was too lazy to go to the garage and set up the miter saw just for a couple of cuts. Instead, I cut the channels with my oscillating multi-tool with the help of my super not ghetto jig. They're not the cleanest or straightest cuts for sure, but that's not a huge deal since they'll be covered by the diffuser for the most part. The channels come with clips to attach them, but I'll be using this Gorilla brand tape instead for a cleaner look. I had to change my plans a bit by lowering the mounting point of the channels to make sure I had enough clearance to open and close the desk. So instead of using the full width of the tape, I used half and cut off and saved the excess. Before moving on, I made sure to test the lights before sticking them to make sure they worked. Totally something I always do, always making sure. So this time we're good though. Here's a huge gap that I'm not too worried about. I did want to block the top and bottom gaps, however, to prevent any distracting light leakage. For that, I'm using this steel stick epoxy putty from JB Weld. How it works is you break off the amount you need, then you mix the two parts together thoroughly until you have a uniform look. At this point, you have a putty that can be molded to whatever shape you need. Make sure not to mix too much at once though, because you only have around three to five minutes before it starts to firm up. It can be drilled and tapped and is good for any general metal repairs. Once the gaps were filled, I stuck on the LED strip once more, then it was time for a quick test. To have the epoxy putty blend in with the channel, I used the silver acrylic paint pen to touch up the joints. You'll see it if you look for it, but it blends in well enough and won't be noticeable at a glance. At this point, it was time for some finishing touches. First up was replacing the baseboard, which I cut down on my miter saw and attached with brad nails. I then covered up the nail holes and gaps with spackle and sanded down the excess when dry. Next up was caulking. It's not something I do very often and I always end up cutting too much off the tip, which leads to excess and extra mess to clean up. I also applied caulking to the top of the desktop at the joints of the 3D printed panels. For this I used some painter's tape to help me get some crisp lines even with the excess caulking. For the edges of the desktop, I touched up the ugly visible connections with some vinyl that I cut on my cry cut. Just like the epoxy on the LED channels, it's something you can see if you're looking for it, but isn't really noticeable at a glance. Now for some shelving, which I didn't initially intend to be white. In hindsight though, it probably works better this way with the whole two-tone look I was going for. To make sure there was easily accessible power outlets, I added a shelf directly underneath the monitor on the right side and secured this power brick that has plenty of outlets on all sides, as well as three USB outlets on the end. For this final shelf, I broke it down and actually won't be using it as a shelf at all. The first piece will be used to help hide this cable mess that I still want to be accessible just in case. It's kind of like cleaning up your room as a kid but shoving everything under the bed, i.e. highly effective. I'll be securing the second shelf piece vertically in the middle cabinet with the help of pocket screws. 
This will create a spot where the laptop could be tucked out of the way behind the monitor. Now it's time to hook everything up and work out some final cable management. I'm using this USB-C docking station hub from Hodo. Hodo? Hodo! Yeah, I haven't heard of them either, but the hub does the job. It has two HDMI ports to hook up the monitors, three regular USB-A ports, and importantly, a USB power delivery input that's been hooked up to this 100 watt power adapter. I only need a single USB-C cable to the laptop to have a full workstation setup that even charges the laptop. Just like I always said as a kid cleaning up his room by shoving everything under the bed, I'll really clean that up properly later. Totally. But first... This project was absolutely mental with so many moving parts, literally. And I have a ton of ideas on how to put all of this stuff together for future projects. With that said, be sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell to be notified when I do post a new video. A like would be pretty awesome too. I mean, if you've made it this far, why not? Again, 50% awesome is about understanding that nobody's perfect, but that doesn't mean that you can't strive to be awesome. So don't let imperfection hold you back. Be the best 50%er you can be, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.